Hi, y'all. Welcome. That was Nazi black metal fuck off. Uh, the track that we uh, took the title of the event from. So I want to welcome everybody here tonight. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. We're excited to host this discussion about anti-fascist black metal uh, with folks who created the new book, Black Metal Rainbows, from PM Press. So just a little quick background. Firestorm is a 14-year-old radical bookstore uh, owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia. Uh, we operate on the land of the Cherokee people, and we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to offer events like this one, both online um, uh, and streamed, uh, because we know that COVID continues to be a barrier for many people in our community. And we really like to reach uh, folks across borders. And we do have uh, a crew from quite a distance tonight. Uh, over the next month, we'll be doing events on food activism, um, the emerging alliance between anti-trans feminists and the far right, uh, and the history of anti-racist action in uh, North America, plus continuing an online reading group on Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. So if you're interested in signing up for future events, uh, follow us on social media, and I'll share a link to our calendar in the chat. So please note that tonight we are using uh, Zoom's Q&A tool. If you've got a question at any point, uh, you can find that tool located at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're on Facebook, uh, you can use the comment section of the stream. Uh, we'll have a Q&A kind of uh, section of the event at the end tonight. Uh, but you know, go ahead and start submitting questions as they come up for sure. So we're going to get started. Uh, Tonight, um, I'm joined by uh, Black Metal Rainbow's co-editors, Danimir Panayatov and Daniel Lutz, as well as book designer, Jackie Raya. Daniel Lutz has written for metal and rock magazines, uh, Terrorizer, Harang, Decibel, and Helvet, a journal of black metal theory. He has a PhD in comparative literature from New York University and is the co-author of Triptych, Three Studies of Manic Street Preachers, The Holy Bible from Repeater Books. And he lives in Montreal. Stanimir Panayatov is Assistant Professor in Philosophy at School of Advanced Studies, University of Tiumen, uh, Tiumen Russia, uh, joining us, I believe, at uh, 5 a.m. Uh, local time. Uh, so a heroic, uh, heroic effort to be here. Um, Stanimir holds a PhD in Comparative Gender Studies uh, from Central European University Budapest. He works at the intersections of continental and feminist philosophy, non-philosophy, and late antique philosophy, and has published in Heathen Harvest, Metal Music Studies, the Minnesota Review, Aspasia, and others. Jackie Raya is uh, an all-Black wearing art director currently living and working in Vermont. She works in advertising and uses her free time to take on a variety of both freelance and personal projects to fulfill herself creatively. After design and typography, metal music is her second work. So thanks so much y'all for being here tonight. This book um, is like such a delight. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of PM Press books and this one is truly unique. It's so gorgeous cover to cover um, and the content is really impressive uh, as well. I can't wait to hear more from y'all about it tonight and about your work uh, together and as individuals. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass off uh, to Stanimir to hear a little bit more uh, about the backstory on this title. Well, well um, yep. Um, thank you so much, Liberty. Thank you for having us and organizing this. Um, we're really excited to be here and hi to everyone in the Zoom. Thank you for, um, for coming uh, and showing interest and support for our book and PM Press. So um, um, this book uh, came about um, um, already seven years ago, I would say. Um, the backstory to, the, to it, uh, we, uh, we actually credited uh, quite uh, extensively in the book intro, has to do with, um, with um, a rather niche event um, in 2015. 
um, uh, in Dublin, Ireland, um, where um, uh, Daniel co-organized with uh, um, Michael O'Rourke, who at the time used to be very active in, in uh, queer studies um, and related fields. Um, uh, they organized an event co called Coloring the Black. Um, so the uh, title itself uh, um, was kind of suggesting that there's something about black metal that, that needs a, a little bit of spicing up. Uh, well, more than spicing up sometimes. Um, and um, and the, 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 the symposium featured a really interesting lineup with uh, uh, people like uh, Drew Daniel, um, Vincent Connell, etc. Um, um, so as a result of that, some time after, um, I think Daniel uh, reached out and, and uh, uh, singled me out. Uh, from uh, participants and asked me, are you interested in developing something like a um, off project out of this uh, event? Um, I gave it the thought. Uh, it was a kind of challenge because I've never uh, thought I'm actually going to do a music book. Um, and and here we are, uh, seven years later. It was a gigant gigantic process. Um, 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 it was uh, quite quite a challenge because the book uh, became. Um, to some extent, really different project from the original symposium. Um, there, were, there are some uh, papers that were originally featured at the symposium, but, but I would say the majority are not, um, also given the fact that, that there is uh, an art aspect um, of, of the book, which, which is not really related to, to the symposium. Um, I think that's the backstory. What, what I want to do is I, I just want to um, finish this short intro with just I want to read out loud uh, one of the statements in in the in the blurbs, but um, one of our own descriptions in the book um, to also kind of be in line with this event. Um, so I'll just read the paragraph out loud of what this um, uh, book really is about. Um, and it goes like this, black metal is a paradox, a noisy underground with metal genre brimming with violence and virulence. It has captured the world's imagination for its harsh yet flamboyant style and infamous history involving arson, blasphemy and murder. Today, black metal is nothing less than a cultural battleground between those who claim it for nationalist and racist ends and those who say, that's us, um, and you guys, Nazi black metal, fuck off. Also, before I before we continue, uh, um, uh, I will show the hardcover um, uh, version of the book, which looks like this without the dust jacket. Um, I don't know if people can see. Um, Jackie designed it in a very beautiful way, obviously too. But this one has the the the, the letters in a kind of rainbowy effect. That's it, as a way of intro. <laughs> Thanks so much. Jackie, do you want to come in next um, and share a bit about the design process in your work? Yeah, sure. Um, I put together some slides, which uh, I promise this is not going to be your run-of-the-mill boring-ass um, slideshow. Promise. It's after hours. Also, get a drink. Let's just have a nice time. Um, OK, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, good. Okay, awesome. Um, all right. So, uh, like Liberty said, I my name is Jackie Rea. I'm the um, creative director. I live north of the wall in Vermont. Um, I do have a day job. I work in advertising, but like she said, um, I'm very much into uh, taking on fun projects in my spare time, especially ones that have to do with music. Um, I have been a metalhead since I was 16, um, much to my parents' chagrin, even though they are very supportive which I appreciate, um, it was not a phase, see? So, uh, but I've done a lot of work around metal. I've done work for Invisible Oranges. I've done work for Maryland Death Fest. I've worked, done a bunch of logos and art and album stuff for uh, bands and blogs and whatever. So, uh, cool. So uh, let's talk about design. Um, so when I was approached to uh, work on this, um, I really, I could not imagine a cooler project because like I said, uh, metal is one of my favorite things. So is design. So when you put these two things together, it's gonna be magic, at least in my brain. 
Uh, so let's talk about the design, but before we do that, I know that there's probably a lot of people on this call that are maybe not as familiar with black metal as um, I might be. So let's take a look at the uh, landscape of what the design and art generally might look like in black metal. Uh, so we're going to take a trip, quick trip to the past. So let's get into what design will generally look like. Um, this is the cover of Venom's Black Metal, which came out in 1982, so I'm almost as old as that. This is one of the earliest albums of the first wave of Black Metal, and you can see or, um, that the genre has evolved musically, but it's really kept the name Black Metal. Visually, we've got the kind of abstracted bland logo at the top. We've got the black letter at the bottom. We've got like a devil on the cover. We've got the inverted pentagram. We've got the horns whatever. It's like evil. Sure. It's very easy to draw parallels from this to what the aesthetic of black metal will eventually look like stereotypically. Um, so next here we have Mayhem's logo. So Mayhem is one of the more well-known bands from the second wave of black metal. Um, they're kind of taking the sound and visual themes of the first wave and building upon that going more evil, darker, more extreme. And you can see that the logo is more illegible than uh, Venom's. You can kind of see that it says mayhem, but maybe if you're not familiar with metal, you might be like, what the hell does that say? Um, it's also got some pretty prominent uh, symbols in it. It's got our upside down crosses, it's got bat wings. It's spiky, right? So let's look at the rest of what the black metal stereotypical aesthetic looks like. Here's a very small mood board that I put together of what I consider to be like the stereotypical black metal aesthetic. Looking across, you'll see it's obviously very devoid of color. There are some black letter fonts. There are some very ridiculous outfits. There's a lot of grimacing going on because everyone is always sad and or angry. Um, and then there's also some really high contrast in the photo so that you're uh, almost like the black is disappearing into the background, right? Does it, you know, does it match the mood of the music? Absolutely. It's all so similar. It's homogenized. It's expected. So the larger question is, does it have to be? And so that's going to, um, let's switch the focus to what we're really here for, which is black metal rainbows and what the design means for that. So um, this is a very quick timeline that I put together to show where I'd be came into the project basically and um also uh i didn't couldn't think of another segue from that into the actual design of the book so here you go uh here's a timeline like they said they were kind of coming up with the idea in 2015 um and then i was brought on board uh in about 2018 to work on the proposal so i just wanted to note that um after i did the proposal and they decided to work with pm as a publisher um, they decided to bring me on as co-author, which I am very, very appreciative of because uh, design often will take kind of like a like a sidebar to um, editors or authors or anything like that. And the fact that they brought me on as co-author, even though I was just the designer and art director for the project, really meant a lot. And I, I've been saying that every time that I get to speak about this book, and I'm still very appreciative of that. Um, so that being said, uh, the original brief from Daniel and Sinemir is that they wanted this book to visually harness the chaos and energy from the music genre, but to add in the spice and the beauty and the power and the sparkle that comes from the collective of writing and art that we were spotlighting in this book. But that also begged the question, what will black metal look like in the future? What should black metal look like in the future? What hand will this book have in ushering that in? And if we could fast forward in time, what do we want the final result of this book to look like? And so with that in mind, I started to develop what would eventually be the look and feel for this project. So I started to explore dark textures that felt very digital, but still had the grunge and grit and darkness of the genre. I started layering in these very colorful, glitchy, chaotic textures, which they almost look like a mistake when you look at them. Um, like a monitor gone haywire or something dragged across a scanner. But when you layer them with the dark textures, it was starting to become its own thing and it was starting to become really beautiful. And then the last element that I added in was in my mind, the most chaotic, which is scribbles, which is an inconsistent yet consistent element, which I use to draw the eye to specific elements on a spread. 
And then so these things uh, paired with the fonts that I chose created a visual language or a graphic universe that this book uh, started to reside in. And then so obviously looking at these elements in abstract, uh, they don't really mean very much probably to anyone else. So let's look at how they were utilized in reality. So here is the uh, full title spread of the book. So you can kind of see um, there's very little content. And so those elements are allowed to really take the forefront and they're really um, letting the eye focus on the title in the uh, bottom left and then the big rainbow shaped logo. So you see, again, I'm pointing out the dark texture then you have the bushy chaos. And then here's another example of a pretty text heavy spread where those elements were used pretty sparingly, um, but I, I wanted to use the scribbles to um, call attention to pull quotes or information that I think is uh, relevant. And in, in this case, it's kind of like a soft intro to the book at the end of the first article. Um, and then um, I also wanted to use the scribbly things to add a human touch to the book because I feel like black metal can be pretty inaccessible, especially if you're not familiar with the genre. And I wanted this book to have a like a human touch to it, like I said, so that you know you kind of felt like um, when you took a book out of the library and like someone had gone through and underlined a bunch of stuff, like you feel like you're able to see the thoughts of the person that read it before you. And I feel like that was a really nice way to um, make it feel a little bit softer than black metal can <laughs> often uh, come across. Um, here's another uh, example of the scribble. Again, a lot of the book, there's some very text heavy pages and I just went through on every piece on every page and added something in by hand because I wanted to make sure that each piece was treated uh, similarly. Um, so one last example. I thought this was a really nice example showing the darkness over the colored glitchy texture and then the scribbles together. I did this for pretty much the opening of every um, new writing piece kind of got the same treatment, but they're all of course different. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so now, now that uh, Black Mill Rainbows is out into the world, where do we go from here? So as a closing to my segment, I wanna highlight one of the pieces that was my favorite from the book. It was an art piece by the artist, uh, Scott McPherson. Um, this is a piece called Nihilistration. And if you recall from the top of the presentation, when we looked at the mood board of all the stereotypical black metal stuff, um, there's various levels of illegible logos and an absolute void of color. And I feel like his piece is a comment on that for sure, which is layering vivid colors and a completely excessive amount of color um, in the spidery, drippy, spindly layers. And it, to me, is could not be the more opposite of what we looked at before on the mood board. And I don't know, you know, what he was thinking when he made this piece, but for me, it's like it's poking huge fun at black metal and how serious it can take itself. And it's adding that self-aware, tongue-in-cheek, definitely carnival-esque uh, layer to it, which I find to be absolutely delightful. Um, and after all, like how serious can you be about a music genre where people prance around in forests and makeup and glittering studded outerwear? So as a final statement, I have uh, nothing left to say other than black metal is for everyone. Thank you so much. That was incredible. And I want every Zoom presentation that I'm involved with from now on to have you on it to share <laughs> a, a, a spread, a, a slideshow. Um, uh, Daniel, if we could tag you into the conversation to share more about the project. Sure. Um, thanks for everyone for, for being here. Thanks for having us. Uh, so I wrote a short paper because uh, that's how I roll. So if it's OK, I'll just read that. Um, so it's called Black Metal Carnivals. There are lots of theories about where black metal corpse paint comes from. Does it come from Kiss and Kabuki face paint? Does it come from sarcophago? Is it, as Drew Daniel perceptively argues, an inverted descendant of minstrel show blackface. What if, and Black Metal Rainbows is in many ways a big set of what ifs about black metal, it comes from clown makeup, from clowning, corpse paint as Pierrot, black metal as sad clown, sad, angry, wild, crazy clown in the forest, clowning in the snow and ice, 
Grim and Frostbitten Clown Corps, Insane Clown Forest. My chapter in the book is called uh, Bizarre Black Metal. And by examining the subgenre of carnivalesque circus music, clown core black metal, it posits the question, what if black metal were a carnival? A weird, twisted, blackened carnival. Let us remember that carnivals, as Russian theorist Mikhail Bakhtin explains, are sites of resistance and reversal, where the king is turned upside down, even for a day or a weekend, just like Christ is inverted in black metal, hanging head down on the cross. In Britain, the carnivals organized by Caribbean communities were key sites in anti-fascist organizing and anti-racist punk in the late 70, in the late 1970s, such as the 1978 Carnival Against Racism, which saw 100,000 people march in London ending in a concert featuring the Clash and Steel Pulse, with reggae and rock coming together against racism. What would black metal as a carnival look like? My chapter, situating the origin point of circus rock, with the Beatles being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, traces a genealogy of this subgenre, looking at how the Beatles and the Rolling Stones with their 1968 rock and roll circus begat Pink Floyd, who begat King Crimson, who begat Screaming Lord Such, who begat Ozzy Osbourne, who begat Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart, The Residents, Devo, Fetus, Oingo Boingo, and Danny Elfman, all the way through Mr. Bungle, Corn, Slipknot, and Insane Clown Posse. Evil Clowns, as Mark Derry reminds us in his seminal essay, Cotton Candy Autopsy, Deconstructing Psycho Killer Clowns, were huge in the 80s and 90s, largely due to John Wayne Gacy and Stephen King, who turned him into Pennywise, the evil clown of it. A case could be made that the evil clown is now the dominant form of clown, period. Black metal has not been immune to the fascinations of clowncore, with its bizarre and experimental carny vibes, creepy organs, and swirling, proggy forays into carnivalesque lunacy. Christopher Rigg of Norwegian experimentalist Ulva named his record label Jester Records, and his other band went by the name Arcturus and the Deception Circus for a while. Black metal even took the circus into space, with bands like the Covenant and Dodheim's Guard careening cosmic circuses through the galaxies. Yet, the carnival is no utopia. Even Bakhtin's carnival is ambivalent. While it is a site of reversal and rebellion, of revolutionary potential, it is also a controlled setting, an allowed and sanctioned revolution, a collective blowing off steam on the part of the oppressed plebs. There are also apparently fascist carnivals or fascist pseudo carnivals whose function it is to ritualize performative cruelty in the function of state power. Theodore Adorno writes of fascist clowning as far back as 1947. He knew that fascists use clownery as part of their performative violence. Clowning serves to mask true intentions. It's a clown. How dangerous can it be? Clowns can get away with anything. Clowns can get away with murder, said John Wayne Gacy to the cops who were investigating him for being a serial killer of young men and boys. Fascist clowning is back. From around 2015 onwards, coinciding with the Trump electoral campaign, the rise of the online alt-right brought fascist clowning to the mainstream, with an array of Pepe's, Groypers, Wojak memes, Richard Spencer, Milo, Alex Jones, etc., that whole crowd. Now we have Marjorie Taylor Greene and George Santos taking on the baton. There is plenty of black metal that partakes in fascist clowning all the way from impaled Nazarene, whose Sardian and nuclear war annihilation fantasies nonetheless allowed for small-time homophobia, to Peste Noire, who along with their nationalist politics, French goliardery, and attempts to fuse black metal with trap music, 
have even brought back blackface explicitly into the black metal aesthetic. But fascists don't own the carnival, and it is kind of laughable to think they should. So here we are, having our own party which vehemently seeks to wrest the carnival back from them through black metal, which we see as always having had a liberatory carnivalesque cackle running through it. Black Metal Rainbows opens up a variety of spaces in and through which black metal can be grabbed back from fascists who seek to claim it as their own. One of these is the carnival. And the wealth of reckless, joyful, queer, bizarre creativity that has congregated around this project is testament to that. The left must stake its claim to the carnival's potential for wild revolutionary enjoyment, for weird, wicked, queer, anti-fascist laughter that strikes fear in the hearts of oppressors, abusers, gods and masters everywhere. Black Metal Rainbows comes from a dream, which was based on a New Year's Eve party organised by the band Akakoka in 2002 in London. This was a real event. In the dream, I saw a bunch of black metal fans congregating along a Mediterranean hillside and woke up with the idea. What if black metal was a party? Not a party of one, but a party of many. A wild, elusive party that doesn't even necessarily know it's a party, but we'll sure soon find out. What if black metal was secretly a carnival all along with all the liberatory potential and power it can muster and generate? Thanks. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to discussing further. Thank you. Um, would any of y'all like to share anything else as part of this kind of opening discussion before we go into intermission? Yeah, I wanted to um, bring in a little bit more um, background um of uh, the book on, and this time it i'm just going to focus uh, briefly on one of the pieces uh, that we have um uh, but i want to start first by um saying something that uh, we recently i recently said in an interview we gave for a for a bulgarian design mm -hmm. um did, which is kind of i just want to canvas a little bit uh um, um, wider before I uh, segue into 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 the piece I want to uh, speak about briefly and why I think it's important um, and and kind of rep representative of what we're discussing today. One thing um, that I think is very important to understand is uh, how black metal has under underwent an evolution. Um, so uh, not just uh, um, uh, aesthetically, but also politically, and the other way around, right? I, I think the book, to to a large extent, is a, um, um, a kind of intervention into into the evolution of uh, black metal. Uh, it's not something static. I think this was really uh, the point was made really well by by Jackie's presentation on the visual side. But there's also the question of black metal as a kind of lifestyle um, ideology, if you will. Um, so um, um, I, I think the problem is that for a very long time, metal cultures were kind of this um, coming of age environments. Um, and I think that has changed. Um, this is a relatively new or gradual phenomenon um, um, that, that's, um, that's changed. It's very much a place of the past now. Metal is no longer a place where you go simply to grow up. It is a place uh, for you know all sorts of weird kids, juvenile outcasts, um, um, <clears throat> you know, mature fuckers, you name it, right? In other words, metal used to be a place of temporary transformation that leads you to stultifying maturity. Um, uh, it's a kind of place where you can abandon uh, everything as soon as you marry, um, you decide to outgrow metal as a phase, right? And then I think that this really has changed dramatically since the 2000s, although gradually. Um, it's a kind of container for allegedly antisocial, non-conformist behavior, uh, but metal no longer serves this function of, you know, this is just, you know, part of my life. It's a phase, a phase for which I am passing through because, you know, much of the heterosexual dominance behind it has changed as well. Um, and that's simply because heterosexuality as such is no longer 
something that we look at, this is something compulsory. I think, you know, this has changed dramatically over the past 40, approximately 40 years when, you know, the genre was birthed. This, of course, means um, a certain kind of normalization of uh, the kind of abnormality of black metal culture. And I, I, I personally do believe this is something good. It doesn't really take away from its um, kind of dark glitter. Um, because today, like, what well, today, what happens is one can live in and with um, with uh, metal in a kind of um, kind of longer kind of spiral of life. Um, so you don't enter the genre as a kind of passing phase, and then you know you go into you know kind of stiff uh, conjugality, so to speak. It's always out there. Um, it isn't this juvenile aberration which it was perceived to be for a very long time. Uh, what does this mean? This simply means that whatever is considered weird or queer about it now, um, of course, um, is not that revolutionary. But is this something good or is this something bad? Well, depends who you ask. I, I think it, it's kind of both, but I'm more on the good side. Um, and I think, you know, um, I, I don't think that kind of this notion of Black metals abnormality and ex extremism as, as revolutionary can meaningfully make um, a lot of sense, at least nowadays. Um, <clears throat> so it's not a phase of transgression versus normalization. And, and that's also because queerness is now also not kind of a stage impersonation, right? Um, in and of itself, it's not a kind of quotidian habit. Um, so yeah, I don't think this takes away from you know the desired extremism of the culture, but it enriches black metal to the point where um, where it's kind of indiscernible between life and art. Um, um, this is um, by way of intro to kind of, uh, uh, maybe that's kind of the second part of my intro <laughs> um, when, when I think about it. Um, um, I just wanted to be very brief at the beginning, and now I just want to focus very briefly on one of the chapters. Uh, it's King Kelly's chapter. Um, so I'm just going to show it before I delve into it. This is how it looks like. Um, it's um, you know another illustration of Jackie's work. Um, it starts with two um, quotations. Um, and here I just want to focus on, on a couple of paragraphs. I'm going to read them out loud, say a few words, and I think then we can segue into, into, in, into the broader uh, discussion. Um, so um, she goes on um, to first provide a paragraph on, on kind of the history of black metal, then the 1980s, the kind of British context um, also, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, she goes like this. Despite the historical context, when black metal's uh, fitful, bloodstained march toward global popularity first truly hit its stride in the 1990s, those involved in the genre's second wave rejected any notion that their creation was based in anything but pure hatred. Norway and Sweden uh, dominated black metal's discourse throughout the 1990s, while South American bands forged their own concurrent path in relative obscurity. Norwegian bands, in particular Burzum, Mayhem, Dark Crown, Emperor, and Thorns, became the face of the genre and the rebels in their social and musical transgressions as they raked in attention um, from horrified journalists and befuddled music critics alike. Even then, as the genre was finding its first set of sea legs, there was something rotten in the state of black metal. Racism, anti-Semitism, and misogyny were rampant within the second wave, and escalating violence became its hallmark, with several of its biggest names engaging in racist attack, homophobic hate, uh, hate crimes, arson, and murder. Uh, um, Jan Axel Blomberg, better known as Mayhem drummer Hellhammer, made the black metal scene's deeply rooted white supremacy problem clear when he told one of the authors of the influential books, Lords of Chaos, um, <clears throat> black metal is for white kids. So um, this is a little bit of historical content and, and, and then one more paragraph. Black metal's political and ideological ambiguity there's this problem of, you know, well, you know, some, some of black metal, if not more, is kind of like politically, we don't really want to take, take a stand. We can talk about that, whether this is actually true historically, 
Um, we will rather say it's not. So uh, black metals, political and ideological, ideological ambiguity remained elastic during the first waves, punk influenced early uh, steerings, but then hardened as the second wave crested. So we focused in our book, in our approach on kind of problematizing um, the second wave as uh, represented as the first wave in many ways, or, or the second wave represented as kind of the founding act because it's not. Right. This is what still allows it to be interpreted so broadly and to be claimed by so many conflicting perspectives. It is why anarchist black metal coexists uh, with neo-Nazi black metal and why both camps are able to lay some legitimate claims to the genre. The far right has been more successful in claiming black metal as its own for a variety of reasons, but those on the left have never ceded that ground without a fight. I think Daniel's point about the carnival is that, you know, there's a black metal fascist carnival, right? And this is kind of what she's saying here. That tension between the two camps has reached a boiling point in recent years. Um, and one must ask, if black metal is truly about freedom, then how could it be anything but anarchist? before we can get into the justification for black metal being um, sorted firmly into the anarchist tradition, you must first break down why exactly fascists have had such a strong track record in claiming it for their own um, aims. Um, I guess I'll stop here, but you know, the Kim, Kim, Kelly, Kim Kelly's point is, um, you know, um, that, um, you know, there's this kind of two tracks of the genre and you know, but she she's not really ambiguous as to should there be two. Um, I, I also don't think you know it's necessarily a binary discourse. You know, uh, one versus the others. Um, I, I think um, the book is a testament to the fact that you know it's also very difficult nowadays to claim that there is two tracks. Like one is the good, one is the bad. One is you know the anti. Fascist, the other is the fascist. I, uh, the, 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 I mean, black metal is so developed that there is also so all these kind of gray areas, misty gray areas in between, where you have people who kind of bend their ideology. You know, sometimes they're kind of crypto fascistic, sometimes they're kind of anti fascistic, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a spectrum, but, but the real problem that Kate, uh, Kelly's um, text addresses, which I think is uh, quite representative of the state of the book, is, you know, what do we do with, you know, nationalism, racism, misogyny, sexism, um, 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 uh, homophobia, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because despite the evolution I was talking about at the beginning, what, what, what's really disturbing is, is that these phenomena are still quite alive, and they come from the second wave, and they're still here to stay. So I'll stop here. Great, thank you. Um, Daniel, did you want to chime in and add anything to that? Well, I, yeah, I had something short to add, which I think uh, kind of speaks to what Stanimir was saying. Um, obviously, um, you know, um, Nazi black metal fuck off is, is the title of the, uh, this event. You know, it, it's on the back of our book. Uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, a strong part of our project. Um, but uh, what we wanted to do with this book is we wanted, uh, we didn't want it to just be a project which says no to something. We wanted it to be a project which says yes to something. Um, so uh, I'm just going to read a short bit from our intro. Um, and uh, this is a quote from the introduction. Black metal likes to trade on being a no genre against the world, against life itself. Do you think black metal wants to mock and offend and desecrate everything except itself? L-O-L. If you think that black metal wasn't poking fun at itself, deflating its own pretentiousness and self-seriousness pretty much every step of the way, then you're not seeing the full picture. You're missing out. Have you even read Nietzsche? Black metal, burner of churches, vengeful destroyer of sacred spaces. It would be a bit ironic if black metal itself wanted to be some kind of safe space, but for white male tears only. No. 
Black metal as a music is too good to let racists have it. They didn't invent it. They didn't give us corpse paint. They don't own it. And they never will. Because there is more to black metal than its Nazi associations, which we don't need to downplay or ignore. In fact, we need to recognize them so as to be able to reclaim the genre, not without or in spite of them, but against and beyond them. A black metal rainbow shines over Nazism's graveyard. Thank you, Daniel. And would you be willing to introduce the tracks that we're going to play as we go into a um, an intermission of about seven minutes during which people can take a bathroom break or stretch? <laughs> yeah, OK. So. Um, if I'm correct, uh, I believe so. This is going to be two tracks uh, from the compilation album. So the compilation album, uh, Black Metal Rainbows, um, it's available on Bandcamp. Um, I'll put the uh, let me just put the link uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm sorry. So uh, this is a this compilation came out in November. Um, it's uh, basically a fundraiser for um, queer and trans youth charities, uh, including the Trevor Project. Um, we've raised um, just over $10,000 so far. So uh, it's been doing well. Um, so there'll be the two tracks from the compilation that we'll play are uh, Obzagel, Voices of the Ether, and uh, Luna Cult. Um, Upon Dark Wings. So these are two of the tracks. The compilation is 130 tracks long, so it's about like 13 hours of music. So uh, I think uh, the world is divided between people who've made it all the way to the end and people who haven't. Um, and um, basically uh, on Bandcamp Friday this week, so this week on Friday it will be Name Your Price, so that means all the money if you buy it on Friday, all the money goes to the charities rather than a cut going to Van Camp. So uh, check out the music, check out the link, um, and uh, we'll see you for the Q&A. Yes, and please do take this time to write out your questions. We've already got a few, but we'd love to have more uh, lined up to check in on when we come back. All right, see you all in a minute.
fantastic, great track selection. Um, so uh, y'all have not disappointed. We've gotten a ton of great questions in the Q&A, um, which I will say is not a surprise uh, because when we announced this event, uh, we were blown away by how much response we got on social media. I don't think I fully appreciated how many like queer feminist leftist black, uh, black metal fans there were uh, in our timeline. Um, but I, I knew y'all were gonna show up with great questions. So we'll just jump right in and I'll share a few of those. Um, we might not get to all of them, but the we'll truck. Um, so uh, one of the first questions we got um, was about keeping up momentum of queer visibility in black metal. Um, uh, Larissa asked uh, about this and said uh, that she's honestly worried about counterattacks by white power and right wing posers and noted that things have been pretty bad in the Northeast uh, recently. So I'm wondering, um, yeah, if y'all have any thoughts on, on that question of uh, maintaining momentum and expanding on wins. Well, maybe I can start. Um, um, I mean, I, um, I guess there's a flurry of events that Larissa is uh, particularly focusing on, um, um, particularly in the north, uh, in the northwest. But um, I'm, not, I'm not sure um, if they are kind of in some sense subculture related, or they're just like kind of wider kind of phenomenon. But if there is a sense of, you know the book uh, kind of uh, being part of this whirlwind of kind of you know aggression and violent affects and and and, and acts um um i guess this is where the question was going sort of like you know attacks on you know queer people and queer kids that might be actually coming from a particular cultural um, and subcultural background. So, but but I'm not really sure this is actually a new phenomenon in a sense. Um, uh, but I but I see the point and the worry that it's uh, something that um, you know comes and goes in waves. Um, uh, this is particularly I'm kind of um, 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 insightful also for me. I just had a class today. This this semester I teach a course that's called Hatred and Violence, and um, I was just teaching a course, uh, a class um, <clears throat> today on, um, it's a kind of classical book by um, <clears throat> this uh, Franco-American uh, philosopher, René Girard. Um, his book is called The Scapegoat. And it's a kind of a cultural, historical, anthropological investigation of uh, um, kind of the universal aspects of scapegoating. Um, and, 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 and also that kind of evolves into the contemporary notion of a victim. Um, um, but uh, so, so, so I mean, there's uh, something from that 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 can be learned, and it's uh, precisely that uh, the uh, where this is uh, scapegoating is very often characterized by certain stereotypes of persecution, which um, um, have uh, uh, as one of their core elements um, the mob, collective violence, right? Um, but that is not to say there is no one-on-one -on -one attacks and stuff like that. But even when it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's kind of not one-on-one -on -one because there's like this kind of uh, psychological, uh, kind of uh, mental kind of um, 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 background of you know aggression and violence is always something that I do in the name of somebody else. Right? So so even when it's kind of a lone wolf kind of thing, it's not alone, right? Um, I mean, people have created this notion. Anyway, great. Yeah, I mean, I could add to that, that, that in a sense, we're not really inventing anything. Um, we're sort of, I mean, I've worked for many years as a music journalist, and we're sort of, in a sense, reporting on something that is going on and has been going on in this scene for you know, uh, a decade or more, uh, and is now becoming very visible. There's this huge sort of bubbling up from the underground of queer, uh, trans, um, 
anti-fascist, uh, red and anarchist black metal. Uh, you know, this stuff is really, uh, you know, one of the most exciting things about putting this book together and the compilation together has just been seeing how much there is of this stuff going on around the world. Uh, you know, I've received countless emails of, of people saying, you know, if you do another compilation, I want to be on it. Um, can I be on it? Uh, and, um, you know, this compilation is only one among many. You know, there are many different labels and organizations uh, that sort of put together um you know, uh, anti-fascist black metal, um, anti-fascist metal in general. Um, you know, there's a lot going on. There's, there's a hunger for this. Uh, and I think also from fans and music listeners, you know, music is so polarized, so politically polarized these days that people, you know, they're not just happy with uh, being given dragons and wizards anymore. You know, they want some, you know, they want some content there. They want political engagement. Uh, you know, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, and for a long time, sort of political engagement was considered uncool, or it was considered, you know, uh, anathema to sort of something being aesthetically interesting. Uh, and yet, uh, today, we are seeing that the, the two uh, can definitely uh, coexist, and, and that you know, deeply, a uh, deep engagement with politics in, in, in art can really sort of uh, make it compelling uh, in certain ways. So I would say uh, the momentum is there. Uh, I think, um, you know, especially for black metal, which might seem a very narrow niche, uh, but I think it's, it's a gateway into so many different discourses and, and, and you know, dimensions uh, that I think, um, and, you know, like Jackie's timeline showed, you know, this isn't just a moment. Uh, this has been going on for years and it will go on for years. So I think we're in an exciting moment culturally for this genre. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's been exciting to sort of hold on to it and, and to sort of ride that wave. I think it's also important to, like, remember that uh, the few who are loud and stupid do not make up the entire genre. I know we've kind of touched upon that in the past before. Um, I know that things are on the rise, but I think, you know, given the, even, you know, like the support for this book is that means that we are all out here and we are all like hungering for community. And I think that's something too, that's important to remember is that um, the way we're wired, we're wired for community. We human beings, function best when you are in communities and if you remember that you are part of a larger community who love you and want you here um it's a lot less scary i think to go out into the world where you're like well there's people that you know might want to harm me or whatever like we are all here everyone is here you can't break you know the whole the whole thing where you have a bunch of sticks and you can't break the sticks but you can break one but, you know, when they're in a group, it's harder to break. That was very inelegant. But you know what I'm saying? Like, we are a community. And I think that it's, an, I think remembering that is hopefully, like, inspiring and empowering for people who want to continue this energy. And, like, you also, you know, like, everyone has to take part in their community. Make a zine. Throw a show. Make a piece of art. I don't know. Do something. Just make your, make your presence known. Go to shows in groups. <laughs> punch Nazis, um, whatever you can to uh, continue to make um, shows a, a safe space, to make art a safe space, to make your life a safe space. And I think that kind of maybe goes into another question that was um, put forward, which I think maybe Jackie is partly for you, could be for everybody, um, just about the kind of response from the black metal scene uh, to, I think the uh, the design and aesthetic that you've put forward with this book. Um, and the person asking the question said, uh, you know, do, tra uh, do traditionalists, and I think maybe there's some debate about what constitutes traditionalism within black metal, but do traditionalists feel that this is going against the typical representation of black metal? Um, so yeah, I'm curious, uh, how has the the kind of aesthetic of the book been received by uh, both maybe readers and uh, random critics on the internet? <laughs> uh, I don't know 
know if anyone has really said anything about the design specifically. I know that everyone is like, oh, that's cool. It's kind of the general consensus, which I'm very appreciative of. But I think, um, you know, when we were looking for uh, people to, you know, like take a look at the book and uh, offer advanced praise, there was a person that I put on the list because we wanted some people to kind of do art and design specific, uh, you know, commentary. And we got actually, I think our first piece of hate mail, first piece of hate mail, I think from him, one of the only ones, which I'm grateful for, but uh, I was like, oh, damn, don't meet your heroes. That sucks. Um, because he was like, this is everything that I hate. This is not what I stand for. I don't remember what he said. I actually kind of want to print it out and like hang it up. in my Because <laughs> I'm like, if I'm doing something that warrants hate, I think we're doing something right. But generally, that's kind of how I feel about it. If you don't like this and you have a visceral reaction to what it looks like, what we stand for, the people that we are championing, the writing and the art that we are spotlighting with this book, then uh, sorry, but you're tired. You're old. You're boring. I don't want anything to do with you. If you want things to stay the same, we don't really get We're not going to get along. I don't really care what you think or say. Like, if your reaction to this book and this project is a negative reaction, then I think that you need to take a strong look in the mirror and think about where your uh, ideals and values lie because they're trite. Any other um, uh, book responses that uh, Daniel or Stanamere, you y'all would want to share? I can also go into another question, and um, this is a question where you will definitely know that I am a poser because I'll probably mispronounce these bands' names, uh, but I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, so uh, an anonymous uh, participant asked, um, I'm wondering what y'all think about bands like Alcest, um, who evolved from a former National Socialist black metal band, Pest Noise. I wonder if they are seen in the modern national socialist black metal scene as having sold out. And more generally speaking, should we welcome those who have left that scene in search of something more? Any thoughts on uh, on on the crossover from the national socialist black metal scene uh, and and where where folks like that fit in? Um, I can see the question actually, and I think it, I just want to clarify that I think the person wrote, wrote a, it was a typo. I think it's Pest Noir. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll let uh, Sandemir. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. Um, the band is uh, discussed at um, um, several um, places across the book. Um, and I, I hope that that person uh, gets the book and, and also kind of dives into into the mentions um, and um, and what have you around the band, but but I think it's not just a question of this band in particular. I think the what the question really asks is uh, can can a person change, right? I think the question is about um, if I used to be a Nazi and I'm now a traitor to the NSBM scene, can I be welcomed um, in another world and? Um, I have to say that for good or bad, um, good, I think the answer should be a default yes. Um, that uh, that just simply means that you know, you know, people can change, and you know, I think you know what we're trying to do with this whole project because it's you know it's first and foremost a book, but you know, I just want to spell out something that we haven't really discussed actually in other events. Uh, you know, this book and about the project itself is you know has is essentially involved hundreds of people so if we add to the 80 plus people on the from the book all the bands everybody who's contributed um all the workers around the the, uh, the publisher and so etc we're talking about uh, 300, 400 people who are somehow into this ecology of, of the project, right? So, um, I, so, so, you know, just very briefly, I just, you know, uh, want to say, uh, yes, I think um, for, for, for the band in particular, I'm not that familiar with the particular band. I do know of them, uh, of course, 
but uh, but but I think the problem is um, uh, um, if we are promoting something like um, anti-fascist, uh, progressive, uh, kind of lefty uh, black metal uh, with this project, you know, are we comfortable also kind of saying yes to 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 somebody who changed your ideology and, and understood that there's something really fucked up with with a kind of hate cosmology? It, it, the answer should be yes. That comes with the price of can we trust that person? That's the person's responsibility. They will always, uh, they will always have uh, the, that mark in their history, right? And that same is true for 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 Alsace and, 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 their, and their and their past. But 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 uh, we have to kind of have this fragility of community um, and, and allow people that they want to evolve to to be welcomed in whatever we do, right? Um, and and we also have to be careful when we do that. I mean, just to add to that, um, you know, the band Dark Throne, uh, in their early days, you know, on Transylvanian Hunger, they have Norse, Norsk Arisk black metal uh, written on the album. Uh, and they have many times sort of um, kind of, uh, you know, distanced themselves from those statements, apologized for those statements, uh, condemned those statements. So like, um, you know, I think it's, in the case of Alceste, I'm not sure. Uh, I think he has distanced himself from Pessnoir. Uh, um, I haven't followed that particular band uh, too closely, uh, but I think, you know, um, it's all about uh, whether can, uh, people can uh, sort of publicly distance themselves from that and, and show that they're, they've moved on and they're different and they've changed. Um, I think, you know, with this book, we do want to... Uh, you know, I think there are a lot of young people who are, are seduced by all kinds of evil discourses. Um, so, of course, uh, with a book like this, we want to uh, reach people who are, you know, in a position where they are being, um, you know, they're 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 alienated or they're full of rage and they just turn to the wrong uh, sort of bad actors. So, of course, with a project like this, we would like to convince people to sort of uh, come to our side, uh, as it were. Um, so I think a certain kind of uh, degree of bridge building with with people who are sort of borderline, uh, I think is is definitely something that we would not want to sh sort of shut the door against that. That makes sense. It does strike me that this is not a unique question to black metal, right? Like the, the question of de-radicalization out of white power movements is one that I think we have to grapple with in a lot of spaces. And I know um, within the United States context, you know, there are uh, white power organizers who were involved in Unite the Right, who supposedly left the movement, um, got a warm welcome from some folks on the left, and then kind of just ended up right back uh, uh, where they started uh, promoting anti-Semitism and white nationalism. So I guess there's always, you know, you've got to kind of figure out how much, you know, make room for people to, to de-radicalize, but also, you know, not uh, be taken advantage of just because somebody says that they're no longer aligned with their former beliefs. Um, so yeah, that's a, a rich territory. Uh, a question um, from another participant. Uh, actually, it starts with a little story. Uh, I recently went to a small club uh, where I happened to stand close enough to the lead singer of the headliner um, to notice that he was wearing a necklace with a swastika on it. We fucked off, but I can't help but think that there has to be a more concrete action to be taken here. Any thoughts on uh, direct actions I think in the context of show spaces, uh, the, the question sort of got cut off, but I think that's where that was going. Um, I mean, I think if you are, if you're somewhere and you see somebody wearing a swastika, I think you should tell like whoever is running the show, whoever is running the bar, the bouncer, someone large that can grab them by the scuff of the shirt and usher them out into the trash where they belong. Um, and if you try to raise that to somebody's attention and they don't care, uh, that's a larger problem. You probably shouldn't, you know, like, um, 
uh, patronize that venue anymore. I think you should let people know who that is and you know where that's happening so other people can be aware and you know whoever that you know whatever that band is so people can stop giving them money supporting them live buying their albums shirts whatever the hell um i think that i mean really the only concrete actions that i can think of are those is just to kind of spread the word and make sure that they know that they are not welcome um it is very uh intimidating i think to confront someone like that personally like i i've been at a show where somebody just straight up stay hiled in the crowd and i was like do i punch them do i say something what do i do and i was just like i feel extremely uncomfortable and i didn't do anything do i regret that immensely i didn't know what to do i am five four i cannot fight a dude who <laughs> has that kind of ideology but i I didn't know what to do, so I didn't do anything. I wish that I had done something. I wish that I had said something. And, you know, that was like a fair amount of years ago. I think maybe now, I think I would have done something. I would have said something because I feel like that's the right move. And I feel like I'm a little less scared, maybe. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like I said, raise the alarm. Nazis do not belong here or anywhere. I guess um, finding a community is something that really empowers resistance. I think a lot of people don't fight back um, um, in, in such cases, like, you know, Jackie mentioned her own experience. A lot of people don't fight back because they don't feel they're in a community, uh, which kind of begs the question whether you have to be part of a community to resist. I don't think that's the case. There's individual ways to do that. But there's also the aspect that music is a life genre, right? Um, it's a life thing, um, and you go there in a kind of a, a spontaneous community, and you're part of something, and you see something, um, or read something into somebody um, that that's disturbing. Um, and uh, it's very difficult, I have to say, to be wrong about interpretation of black metal in general, <laughs> because you know, this this like for example in industrial music. Uh, the genre is very vague because there's all these crypto-fascist bands who are anti-fascist. Um, well, I mean, some people will argue whether they're anti-fascist, but there are some, some that are, and some that are kind of like, you know, meta-political or whatever. Um, so, so, uh, so, 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 yeah, I, mean, and I think it, it, the more we kind of speak about um, the kind of political ideology, ideological problems of, of black metal today, the more people will feel, um, you know, empowered to, to fight back in, you know, even in small kind of uh, individual ways. And this is not to say that, you know, we're atomized people in society, uh, but it's um, kind of the, 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 it just means you care about your, your music, about your, your scene and about your community. Yeah, there's been um, some additional information shared uh, via the Q&A. Um, someone did uh, name that the individual from Alsace has uh, publicly condemned his involvement with Hess Moore and has a statement up on his Instagram. Um, so I guess that's something that folks could find. Uh, and then kind of related, uh, um, another person kind of brought up this point of, um, you know, it's one thing to kind of say, I don't associate with that anymore. I don't believe that anymore. Um, but then uh, sort of being accountable for uh, your contribution and your harm is another question. So somebody asked about whether or not there are bands that have uh, made reparations towards communities that their words have hurt. And I imagine that in this case, reparations um, uh, might look like um, doing more than just being neutral or not a racist anymore, but actually uh, working uh, to undermine and remove uh, white power from uh, the black metal scene. It, have there been um, artists who have really crossed over from being white supremacists to campaigning against white supremacy in the scene? I take it that silence means no. <laughs> I can't, I honestly, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head that's like completely polarized and switched sides. Um, 
I wish if anyone knows of any, please put them in the chat. I would love to know. Um, but yeah, as far as reparations, I don't really know. Usually what they do is they become sort of apolitical boomers, right? They just sort of like, they go from being youthful Nazis to being, we're not political anymore. And and sometimes when that happens, you have to wonder like, you know, are they just kind of hiding their beliefs for, you know, cynical kind of gain? Because they know that like, you know, if you're a NSBM band, you're not getting signed to Nuclear Blast, uh, although you may get signed to Season of Mist. Uh, so like if you have certain career goals, your band can only get so big if you uh, still espouse those beliefs. So uh, there may be a certain degree of cynicism uh, involved in certain people just kind of dropping out of politics entirely. Well, in another direction, um, we had somebody who was curious about kind of uh, early uh, queer representation within black metal and asked specifically if uh, Gaul was uh, the first within black metal um, to come out as queer. Uh, maybe y'all could share a little bit more about the trajectory of uh, queerness within black metal. Um, we do reference a couple of articles in the introduction. Um, they're kind of like one-on-one -on, -one on who's who, um, um, who who's actually uh, you know queer in black metal. Um, so I, um, I'll go back to those pieces. And I, I recommend people go back to to them. I can um, uh, just give you the reference in a moment. But um, Gal, as as for Gal, I do believe I'm not entirely sure, but she, he should be one of the first ones, um, from what I know. But 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 also there is. Um, um, the, I mean, there's a lot of specificity around his coming out because it wasn't really a coming out. Um, it, it was um, done, as often happens, rather spontaneously in an interview. Um, so he didn't like just post it on a social network and was like, oh, I feel depressed and now I want to feel liberated, right? It was very casual. Um, he um, he um, did not in any way dissociate himself from his um, uh, violent past. Um, he, in other words, he doesn't see a conflict um, uh, between uh, his queerness and his um, kind of uh, ideology. I mean, it's been for quite a long time much more relaxed than it used to be when it comes to the girl, but, but, but uh, um, the guy is not remorseful or anything like that, right? Um, he, he's been, quite explicit about it. He's been asked um, uh, whether coming out as a queer person has changed something about his you know, overall attitude towards life and politics and so that's, I don't think that's the case. So there's nothing revolutionary about Gal's um, 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 uh, sexuality. And I, we, um, I think we make the point somewhere and that's also true for some of the chapters. So, so there's this problem. Um, so, so the question is good in the sense that it opens the whole plethora of other questions. So the question is really powerful because it also begs the question of, um, you know, is it you know enough to be queer to to be kind of changing something? It's certainly not. Um, um, and and uh, um, Gal is the epitome of um, um, the fact that uh, you know being part of minority doesn't. Uh, make you a revolutionist or a liberationist or anything like that. There's always, I mean, just to, not to promote other people's work, but I really enjoy this podcast, um, which is called Bad Gays. I don't know if people know it. There's, there's a, pod, a really good historical podcast by, by two guys. They also published a book recently, and, and that's exactly where I'm going with this. Uh, you know, there's a whole history of horrible queer people. Horrible, horrible uh, queer people. Um, and um, I forgot to say something about the previous question also. Historically, um, uh, it, it, just very quickly, uh, music historically has been used for oppression uh, a lot. So there is, um, uh, for example, the role of music in the, in the Reich, in, in Nazi Germany. Now, uh, music was perceived by, by, by Third Reich as the 
um, um, the genre, the art genre par excellence. Um, there's a very good documentary that people can check it out on, on YouTube by Deutsche Welle um, uh, about the, the history of uh, the Third Reich in, in employing uh, the entire musical establishment of the Bible Republic. It's very weird because all these people that were into classical culture and music uh, became immediately collaborators almost 100%. So for the entirety of, of, of the Reich, music was um, classical music in particular and, and orchestral and symphonic music was the art ideology of, of, of the Third Reich. Sorry, uh, I just forgot about that. Yeah. Great. Right. Another, um, we, we did get a response to the question of um, bands that have really uh, kind of come full circle and are attempting to like um, make amends for the harm that they've caused. Uh, Mike brought up a band in Atlanta named Galder, um, which was previously involved with National Socialist Black Metal and was even signed to Darker Than Black, a Nazi label. Um, but uh, Mike says has since come around to being 100% anti-fascist. So that's great to hear. Also, love that it's in Atlanta, close to close to us. Um, <laughs> uh, so we are coming kind of to the end of our time together, which is amazing to me because it does not feel like we've been talking for an hour and a half. Um, I want to make sure that there's a little bit of time for final comments from um, Stanamira, Daniel, and Jackie. Uh, anything that y'all would like to take us out on? This has been uh, so enlightening and interesting. So I just have a, a quote to end with, um, which is one of our blurbs. So it's from K.W. Campbell, a vile creature. So the blurb is this. Black metal is the ultimate outsider musical genre. So it makes sense that us queers and weirdos would build a home within its barren fields. Black Metal Rainbows is a necessary anthology documenting the strong anti-oppressive backbone being woven into black metal's very fabric. So I think that's my favorite blurb that we've gotten for this book. Uh, and I think it really sums up kind of what the project is about uh, and also the kind of future looking um you know i think we talked about change we talked about progress uh, tonight and i think you know this genre is changing it's being changed by people it's being made into something you know more accepting more uh you know stronger more anti-oppressive it's being in a sense you know it's true spirit is being kind of forged now not in the 90s so i think it's kind of an exciting time to sort of be into black metal and i think projects about leftist black metal are sort of coming up there's a a new book by bill peel uh coming out on repeater books called tonight it's a world we bury which is basically a guide how to use black metal to destroy capitalism. So it's like, you know, there's a lot going on here. Thank you. Um, maybe two things very briefly. Uh, one, um, one thing um, I want to just mention is uh, it kind of has to do with traditionalism um, it, in all sorts of way when it comes to black metal. I think kind of, you know, when Jackie was making her presentation, I told about this a lot. Um, as well, so I want to spell this out, but it's also about the music and the scene and scenes as well. Um, so, so is there something wrong with black and white in um, or corp, black and white corpse in, in in black metal? I mean, you can go into the history of that. You can read uh, Drew Daniel chapter elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I, I I do believe no. So, so everybody has has to have the freedom. I think this is very important, and fundamental, the freedom to choose who they are. Um, how they want to dress and what they want to appreciate. Um, but the whole question for, for me around this project um, very often boils down to, to the following problem. Um, is there something that never changes? So when people talk about traditionalism um, or tradition of black metal, or if somebody like sends an email or a comment on Jackie's Instagram and is like, this is horrible. Black metal is black and white, right? Um, so what does this mean? What is the tradition? I mean, because, you know, people use tradition 
as um, as a defensive habit, right? Um, and I, in some sense, I don't think it's wrong for people to have habits. What's wrong is for people to 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 promote these habits as everybody else's um, agenda. And I think you know this is where everybody has problem with with traditionalism, especially in progressive scenes. Because it's you know tradition in this sense in, in in black metal does exist. Do we have to bow to its authority? No, black metal is not about authority. Black metal is against authority. So so the, the, you see the very appeal appealing to tradition in something like black metal is absolutely absurd and contradictory. Yes, everything has its history, but that's what history is about. History is anyway the most intersectional of this thing, right? It intersects with everything. But um, uh, and final thing. Um, it's about reclaiming the genre. I mean, I, I, I can never pin my finger on whether we're reclaiming or claim or actually claiming it, in a sense, because you know, when you say I reclaim black metal from Nazis and fascists, you put yourself in the weaker position. Um, when you say I own black metal, that's a different position. I'm not sure I want to say we own black metal because that makes me an authority, and I don't want to be that. Right, but 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 there is a sense of I don't want to also say I reclaim it because it means you know it's been taken away from me. Um, and usually, what what I think has very often have been happening in all sorts of political struggles, but also in black metal, um, is that the loudest always have the upper hand. And I'm really not sure that that even when it comes to something like the second wave, you know, uh, the loudest are that many. I think they're a minority. Um, uh, so we have to stop focusing on the loudest, um, silence them, silence them, um, Jackie said elsewhere, so that they can scream in a pit somewhere, right? Um, and, and that's about it. So, so let's just have it as, as something we have. Let's just not reclaim it, right? Because it's ours, it's for everybody. Jackie, do you want to put the final touch? <laughs> I don't really have anything else to say. I think uh, Daniel and Stanimir summed it up really well. I'm just very thankful to have had this opportunity to talk about the book. Um, and thank you for, you know, Firestorm for having us. This was really lovely. And um, I don't know, there's nothing else to say except fuck Nazis, black metal is for everyone. A great note to end on. If y'all haven't already picked up the book, it's not too late, get a copy. You will not regret it. And we're going to go out on one final track from the compilation. Uh, this is uh, If You Want War by Anarchist Wolves.